Thank you, uh, Nikki. I have a PowerPoint presentation I'll open up. Uh, just to give a bit of context, um, this research was conducted about a year ago, and I am not as familiar with the content to be able to present it without following a sort of script and outline, so I will be doing that to maintain time. Um, and I apologize for that in advance. Uh, so much of the previous panels uh, during this conference have spoken about specific strategies uh, for economic development and industrialization in Sub-Saharan Africa, or they focused on um, market um, integration um, initiatives. And my presentation focuses in this area. Um, and specifically, I analyze the impact of regional trade um, agreements on economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, and my case study is on ECOWAS. Uh, due to time constraints, I will focus on the findings from the case study, and I'll present less on the generic findings about uh, regional trade agreements um, and their impact on growth. So really briefly, to uh, outline what I'll be presenting, uh, first is just the introduction to the research. Um, very briefly, the theory that goes behind why these uh, regional trade agreements are happening. Uh, a background on the rationale and drawbacks of these RTAs is what they're also called. And then I get into more in depth the case study on ECOWAS. And lastly, if there's some time, a, a bit of a discussion about what these findings mean. Um, so regional trade agreements, RTAs, and their outcomes for developmental purposes have puzzled economists and governments, motivating a considerable literature on their supposed benefits and drawbacks. At the same time, the number of RTAs in Sub-Saharan Africa has exploded, a proliferation as you see in this map. Um, and called by um, the IMF and uh, UNECA as Africa's spaghetti bowl of RTAs and overlapping memberships between different RTAs. Upon closer inspection, these uh, agreements take on various forms based on a number of variables including depth of integration, the types of member uh, countries, the reciprocal or unilateral application of trade liberalization policies, um, and the growing number and diversity and complexity of these RTAs suggests the importance for impact assessments to analyze broadly, taking into account the context of other RTAs, country level differences, and the region's position in the global economy. Within this context, uh, my uh, paper takes on a critical engagement on the theory and empirical evidence within this debate for both intra-African and north-south RTAs to apply to the case study of ECOWAS. The sorry, the economic community of West African states. I drive two main themes from this analysis. First, I illustrate the methodological difficulties of impact assessments that aim to identify causal mechanisms of growth that result from RTAs in the context of these overlapping um, uh, arrangements. Second, it distinguishes between RTA impact on increasing trade and increasing growth for which the literature has proved unsuccessful in substantiating the link to the latter. Um, really quickly, regional, cra uh, regional trade agreements are a policy tool uh, to promote free trade, which in turn is suggested to promote economic development. Uh, today we know, and I think I usually fall into the trap of um, beating a dead horse, but I think today uh, we've realized that um, these market liberalization agendas cannot be a blind endeavor and that they should be used strategically uh, with prudent state involvement in the economy to direct a dynamic comparative advantage, not a static one, uh, that can drive um, uh, national economies uh, up the value chain. So those are uh, just some broad critiques of the, um, the uh, original free trade uh, theories. Uh, so now with these basics, RTAs are a policy tool to facilitate free trade. There are a number of theories and concepts used to understand the impact of RTAs on increases in trade. However, assessing the aggregate impacts of RTAs, it's just said that it's an, it's an it's a ambiguous impact. And what it really comes down to is whether more trade was created rather than diverted as a result of an RTA being uh, instituted. Uh, very briefly to review the rationale and the drawbacks and strengths and weaknesses for um, our well, um, RIAs are what I, are the, what I use um, as a term within um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's, so it's a regional integration agreement, and they're used, this term is used because usually these are uh, agreements within neighboring countries. 
One of the biggest strengths of an RIA is that it does bring together a group of countries, some of which are landlocked and some of which are coastal countries, which give market access to the landlocked countries to be able to export out of their region. Um, some of the issues, though, that William did already discuss are that there are behind the, behind the border or non-tariff barriers to trade, including uh, infrastructure issues, which I don't need to review. Um, and also, uh, there are other issues um, that arise from the incomplete implementation of these RIAs that result from uh, obstructed, that are obstructed by weak state capacities, fears of losing state sovereignty, and the complexity of states being party to multiple overlapping RIAs. Um, lastly, um, there has been evidence within RIAs that RIAs that are among lower income countries have sometimes the impact of having um, income divergence between the higher income parties of that RIA and the lower income parties of that RIA. And that was said to be due to lacking complementarity of factors of production. Um, my re brief review of the strengths and weaknesses of RIAs in Sub-Saharan Africa indicate that the linear progress uh, process of market integration has been inefficient and or insufficient uh, for the region. While the linear model focuses on tariffs and border barriers, it misses the main impediments for successful intra-African trade, um, such as behind the border issues. Um, uh, UNCTAD uh, proposed a more holistic strategy called developmental regionalism, and we've already been discussing this in earlier panels uh, today. And they describe this as sequenced trade liberalization alongside conscious and planned policy actions aimed at building productive capacities of member countries and promoting industrial uh, restructuring, uh, including alleviating supply side constraints by using industrial policy, development corridors, special economic zones, and regional value chains. Um, in this way, UNCTAD supports an understanding of the concept of economic growth that I propose for my own analysis um, as a sustainable and inclusive growth following from a structural transformation that can offer Sub-Saharan Sub Africa a more substantive role in the global economy. Uh, so therefore, when I'm doing my analysis, I do not merely I, uh, characterize growth, uh, growth as GDP figures, but I include other figures um, uh, that I will be discussing uh, later, including poverty, inequality, export structure, and interregional trade share. Um, I will not uh, discuss in depth the uh, weaknesses and limitations and strengths of the north-south arrangements, but just know that within ECOWAS, there are also uh, north-south arrangements with uh, the EU and the, e uh, the US that are impacting how ECOWAS has growth impacts. And I can get into that into the um, presentation of the fields um, of the case study findings. Uh, so very briefly, ECOWAS is a, a regional arrangement of 15 states in West Africa, uh, initiated in 1975 to promote economic and pol political integration through linear integration based on the EU model. While ECOWAS has not yet accomplished most of its integration goals in the treaty, some progress has been made, including regional conflict prevention and peace building. Um, and some describe, it, describe this as a free trade area that has uh, significantly eliminated uh, tariff barriers and allowed for the free movement of citizens. But some people uh, still disagree about the FTA designation for ECOWAS. Um, in terms of composition, ECOWAS is politically and economically dominated by Nigeria, constituting nearly half the population and GDP of all ECOWAS states. Um, additionally, ECOWAS, uh, ECOWAS's makeup is characteristically divided between landlocked Sahelian countries and more humid coastal countries, then divided again between two uh, sub-RIAs. Uh, one is Francophone countries in a currency union called uh, WAEMU, with a common currency of the CIFA and another Anglophone bloc called um, the West African Monetary Zone, WAMZ. Um, they don't have a common currency within that zone yet, but that was a, a proposal. Uh, the West African region mainly exports a limited range of agricultural commodities, and most economies are characterized as uh, net oil importers, except for Nigeria, of course. Uh, the World Bank says that this kind of makeup exacerbates trade policy as fluctuations in oil prices on the import side are often combined with commodity price shocks on the export side. Uh, very briefly, my case study methods. I did um, this uh, as a disclaimer. This is not using a gravity model um, or uh, regression analysis. Um, given the definition I give to growth as being very multidimensional and comprehensive, um, it would 
be uh, it would be uh, uh, something new in the literature to be able to do a model such as those with these um, definitions of growth. Um, but what I do uh, use are econometric, econometric data over time on measures of GDP, poverty, inequality, export structure, and share in the global economy uh, from various sources to show how ECOWAS's countries have been able to uh, deliver on economic growth over the period. Um, very quickly, uh, from the literature, um, ECOWAS's impact on growth has always been elusive in the literature. Um, and also, uh, uh, there have been more recent articles that have shown that ECOWAS has had an impact on increases in trade. And then other studies that show that increases in trade do have a uh, uh, explan explanatory power on increases in GDP. Uh, however, those studies don't attribute the increases in trade or GDP to ECOWAS. So there are some um, distinctions between those findings and what I'm trying to show here. Um, Skip this. Okay, so to go over the, the, the meat of the presentation and the work that went into uh, this paper is a is this statistical analysis. Um, uh, really briefly to frame these stats, I use stats on a range of indicators to offer a deeper analysis of ECOWAS's effects on growth. From the available data, uh, four aspects of this paper's definition of growth have been quantified, including GDP figures, uh, which is a GDP per capita and GDP growth rates. Um, and then increasing role in the global economy, which I use ECOWAS's GDP as a share of world GDP. Uh, and then sustainable growth via structural transformation. I use the share of exports by product grouping, including higher value added products. Uh, manufacturers uh, are an example of those. And then inclusive growth. So I use the World Bank's poverty and inequality var variables. Uh, this is graph one, and as you can see, uh, it uh, demonstrates the share of trade between ECOWAS members shown by the interregional trade share in the purple dashed line. So this uh, line, as you can see, it, it goes from 1970 to 2010. It's fluctuated considerably, um, but it has um, behaved inversely with the regional GDP per capita, meaning that the share of interregional trade increased during the 18, uh, 1980 to 2000 growth slump, but decreased after 2004 when growth in terms of GDP increased. Um, I assume this is likely indication of the region's dependence on commodity export prices, which uh, dominate its international trade and were driven by this commodity super cycle. Uh, graph two, I'm not gonna review because I'm still questioning uh, how to interpret it. Um, <laughs> which maybe I can uh, get some of your help on or questions. Uh, graph three uh, shows the absolute value of intra-regional intra trade. And I have uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the darkest block at the bottom. And on top of that is within ECOWAS. And on top of that is uh, within WAEMU, which is a part of ECOWAS. So focusing on ECOWAS, which is the blocks of purple, um, this data shown in, the, in these bars uh, uh, presents an optimistic narrative that the absolute value of inter-ECOWAS trade has increased substantially in the 2000s. However, the percent, as shown by the purple uh, dashed line and, the, and uh, with the boxes, um, has shown that the uh, share or the percent of inter-regional ECOWAS uh, trade has decreased slightly over the past 20 years. Uh, this was showing that ECOWAS has not substantially facilitated uh, regional trade, inter-regional trade. Um, at the same time, this graph four shows that ECOWAS exports have become more entrenched in the primary commodities vis-a-vis -vis all forms of manufactured goods. Um, and this is comparing the light purple bars for primary commodities to the small dark purple bars for manufactured goods at the top. Um, if structural transformation is a condition for growth, these findings present a, a negative outlook. But on the other hand, as you can see from the dashed lines, this is breaking up these manufacturers into different levels of um, uh, value added. And the highest value added uh, under the high skill and high technology intensive manufacturers has increased the most. But this is a very small proportion of the economy, so it doesn't demonstrate a whole lot. Um, additionally, while the share of GDP from manufacturers has remained low and stable in many West African countries from 2004 to 2012. Uh, graph five here illustrates the significantly higher and wide-ranging changes in the contribution from the services sector in different countries. 
uh, shown in the dashed lines. This may highlight a structural transformation in countries like Ghana and Liberia, driven not by industrialization, but by informality, which, according to Macmillan et al., 2013, can negatively affect growth due to shifting labor from high to low productivity sectors and increasing unemployment. Um, in the last section of the paper, I uh, do case studies of eight countries in ECOWAS um, on uh, various variables of GDP per capita, um, actually all the variables I already discussed. Um, and so these two, this is an example of one of the eight uh, case studies. Uh, this is Burkina Faso, and I split the indicators into two graphs, um, one showing the uh, GDP per capita and, uh, and growth, uh, the growth rate, and then uh, the poverty and equality variables on the other side. So when you see increases in the red graph, it's a good thing for GDP, and when you see decreases on the other side, it's, it's, um, they're saying that that's a good thing. It's decreasing um, poverty, uh, poverty head counts and inequality rates. Um, in the past two decades, GDP per capita has increased substantially along with high GDP growth rates for most ECOWAS countries. However, when, inequa however, when inequality uh, variables and poverty are included in these profiles, uh, growth has been less uniform. Um, examples such as Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire indicate increasing inequality and poverty headcounts, while in Ghana and Senegal, inequality levels remain stable and both the poverty headcounts and depth of poverty decreased. And, only countries, and the only countries with reductions in inequality were also those with the lowest GDP per capita. Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, and Niger are the examples. Um, to offer a better grasp of what these intra ECOWAS findings mean for growth, um, I do go into the uh, paper. I don't have much time left anymore, and I'm going over. Um, but I do contextualize these findings within the other arrangements, such as the North-South uh, agreements, um, which is the Everything But Arms agreement with the EU, moving into uh, the EPA agreements, and then the US agreements, um, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, so overall, I can conclude um, by saying that uh, growth has been very elusive in the literature, um, but regardless, showing that these findings, uh, showing these findings to you today, do demonstrate that the growth that I'm describing, an inclusive and sustainable growth in, in ECOWAS, has not been achieved, uh, regardless of ECOWAS. Um, and so you can't necessarily blame it on the agreement or lack of implementation necessarily. Um, but there's definitely a need for a more c comprehensive approach to regional integration. And I think some of the suggestions we've had from the other panels uh, very nicely uh, put forward some, um, some strategies for that. So thank you for your time. And um, I can address any questions at the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you.